Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Designing Healthy Environments with AP Monarch. We are architects and sustainability consultants where we design healthy environments for you, for all, and for the earth. Today, I am joined by Tom Bassett Dilly. Hello, Tom. Good morning. Hey, good to be here. Good. I'm glad to have you here. A um, little bit about Tom. The Tom Bassett Dilly is an architect, passive house consultant, and founder of TBD Architects in Oak Park, Illinois. His firm is a 2030 signatory and is devoted to low energy, healthy, and beautiful environments inspired by nature. I love it. Projects include residential, commercial, and institutional new construction and remodels, all planned for a clean energy future. Oh, wow, That's I'm excited. It. I'm excited to talk to you. <laughs> so we'll be talking about passive house for residential, um, healthy homes, and what is decarbonization, right? Um, mm. So Tom, how have you been? How have you been in, since March? <laughs> well really fortunate to say that I've been good and my family's healthy, knock wood, and, and that we're uh, busy in the firm, which I, you know, in every other recession that's come along, it's really hit architecture and construction hard and fast, but this one's different. So I feel incredibly fortunate uh, and, and doing pretty well. And really, I mean, there's been a slowing down of the pace a little bit, less options to go off and do a million things. So I've kind of been enjoying that. I, uh, I, I paint a lot. I do landscape paintings. And so I've been, you know, just able to get out and paint a little more, you know, things like that. So very nice. Yeah. How, how have you been? Have you been weathering it well? Yeah, I, I take it day by day. Uh, because obviously nobody knew what was going to happen and how long we were going to be in this situation. And I have a, I have an eight and seven year old. And so that adds a lot to the day by day. And so we have great days. We have so, so days. And then we have like, yeah. what the hell just happened? Get me out <laughs> of here days. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, we yeah, we're all so healthy, you know, my son uh, is a freshman entering Indiana University as a, in the in the in the mu Jacobs Music School, um, but he'll be he'll be doing it from home. So mm. um, as a as a cystic fibrosis patient, he has to be extra careful about his lungs. So yeah, <clears throat> there's the option to to uh, do school all remote. But man, what a it's it's rough for him because as a musician, you know, he just wants to be with people playing and right. he's been doing it this summer outdoors okay. with the idea of going into a studio with people from all over the world and breathing hard through your instrument. Did you ever see the trumpeters in the jazz ensemble? You know, they, they, they blow off. Yeah. The, yeah. I, you know, I so. felt it sometimes depending on how close you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, that's been the hardest uh, thing. And my wife's a, a, a TA in the in the school district here. And so moving to remote, I mean, there's been a lot of adjustments, there's no doubt, but for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, talk about adjustments. We are uh, my, my husband also he studied architecture, but he never went into architecture, but he loves to build things. And so, mm. you know, our house, we kind of just, we call it the experimental house because we just nice. change things around. And that's what we did. You know, when we found out yeah. that we're just going to be at home, we each needed our workspace and our kids needed their like learning space. So we started just building little nooks. Right. And yeah. um, so I read, an article a couple of weeks ago that you wrote, it was a, it just, I think it was beautifully written because you talk about the healthy aspects of a house, like just the, just a natural daylight that you, that everybody needs and adapting in this, in this time. And I thought, you know, 
this is exactly what we're doing. We're just figuring it out and making sure we're close to a window, making sure that the, you know, we change our filters and we're going to be in here mm. for a long time. And so I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that. And then you also have um, images that you'll be sharing a little bit later about some exciting projects that you've been working on, uh, have been featured. So take it away, Tom. I'm going to yeah. take okay. my pen and take notes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, yeah, so that article was uh, a chance for me to reflect a little bit on how we're looking at our homes differently because we all started sheltering in place. You know, it puts more focus on the home as the environment for work and, um, well, everything because we're spending so much time. I don't know about you, but in those first weeks, it was like I was kind of cautious about just walking next to somebody. We didn't know how easy this virus transmitted. So anyway, yeah. um, it just put the focus on, on, you know, how are our homes treating us? And if you're just in there for, you know, sleeping in a couple hours a day, maybe you don't think about it so much, but when you're there, you know, 20 hours a day, um, mm -hmm. it, to me, it really pointed out a, a number of things. One, um, just the physical indoor quality, air quality and environmental quality, uh, you know, how, well, I should, I should just preface this by saying that my uh, really approach to health and architecture comes from a school of thought, the sort of um, ancestral health movement. So um, the idea that we've been on this earth evolving for a long time. And when you look at the last, you know, million years, it's kind of coming down out of the out of the trees, so to speak, and walking the savanna and forming environments that we can thrive in. Um, it has, our whole genetic makeup has been formed by that. And so the way I see it in the most simple sense is that um, our, our genes are expecting inputs from our environment that are based on, uh, you know, 99% of the last uh, period of time of our existence in this world, but they're getting very, very different signals from our built environment. And so that is, mm -hmm. that runs counter to our health. Everything from, um, you know, the, the, the way light enters our eyes and how it can disrupt our sleep patterns to um, hearing the variable sounds that you hear when you're walking in the woods, let's say, versus the sounds of traffic um, or, um, or construction or, or whatever, planes going overhead. I mean, these are very different inputs, right? And, uh, and of course, what we breathe, how much, how much um, oxygen rich, uh, you know, with, 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 with terpenes coming off the trees or um, I'm forgetting the, the word, but when they were, when the Japanese researchers were studying this, um, this thing that they call forest bathing, they were figuring out why is it that if you take people who are stressed and their blood work doesn't look so good and you send them off to the woods for a week, they come back with better blood markers and less stress, less um, inflammation markers in their blood. And um, so they're trying to, you know, figure out what it is. That's our connection. That's our connection to nature. That's our, that's our bodies and minds getting the inputs that mean that we can thrive. So the big long uh, movement of all this is the biophilic design movement, which, you know, Living Future um, Institute has started the biophilic design initiative and Amanda Sturgeon's written some things about it and some other people have. And so that's the question. How can we make our um, built environments try to give us more of those signals that we can relate to? And so my, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to be in my office. Everybody else is working remotely, but um, you know, we've been trying to build that in the way we filter light and bring in natural materials and patterns and, um, and all of that. So as, as we look at our houses, so many of them built, you know, in this industrial era with a view towards making it easy for the machine or um, efficient or cheap or whatever, you know, we're surrounded by these drywall boxes that are, uh, have holes punched in them for, for light. Um, with no real bearing on a natural metaphor at all. Um, and then you, 
And then you close up that environment and you start cooking with gas, which releases all these toxins. And uh, you, you start to wonder, could we do better? You know, and uh, the answer is, yeah, heck yes. So, um, so that's where we're trying to take it. And, and um, I'm really interested in it as a architect, what the, you know, visual design aspects are, um, but also how the building can be thought of kind of as an organism. If, mm -hmm. if it has, you know, air circulation like lungs, you know, I call these energy recovery ventilators, the lungs of the house. Um, and um, so, so I guess the, the, the big question that I'll just kind of wrap this all up with, um, and I could get into to a little more specifics about the article, but um, the big question really is how much is enough when you're designing an environment, you know, um, if you just add some bits of trim, if you, uh, if you bring in another natural material, if you have a better uh, view to nature, you know, it, it, passive house is really wonderful because it's a very clear metric. You need to make these numbers, and if you do, it works. And if you provide this amount of fresh air ventilation and this amount of exhaust, um, then you certify. But with biophilic design, it's not clear cut. It's like, okay, if you really want to thrive, you know, what, what is the minimum dose? What is, what is the RDA for, for biophilia? You know, how uh -huh. many plants do you need? How much, how much wood, how many natural patterns? So um, I don't know if we'll ever get to a quantification of that, but, mm -hmm. um, and maybe we don't need to, but I guess that's that's sort of where I'm going with this. And so, in the tree in the article that we wrote, and it got picked up by Treehugger.com. Oh, so, um, nice. Lloyd Alter does a lot of great work in, with his group there about a whole bunch of different things from gardening to architecture. Um, and uh, so it's e easy to find there or on our blog. But um, but there I started with just kind of the really three things that I was thinking about um, in terms of our homes and how they're treating us. Number one, just the basic air quality, uh, which I tell you, it's not, it's not uh, regulated. It's not like um, you measure it in a city and say, oh, it's, this is bad air quality today. Stay indoors. There's nothing like that for inside the house. There's just a building code that says you need to have an exhaust fan in your bathroom and, if, and you should have one over your... <laughs> You know, and you can have terrible air quality uh, and people still are stuck on this, like, oh, the house should should breathe and be leaky and all that. And of course, we can talk about why that's why that's right. a mistaken concept about air quality. But um, so and then we're filling it with these toxins, not just from the cooking, but from the formaldehyde in our cabinets and the VOCs in our um, in our uh, finishes and in our cosmetics and our, uh, you know, all this stuff, but um, it, so you know, it's 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 unfortunately there's a lot of toxicity in the in the construction world, which is easier to get away from now. That's the that's the great news. There are a lot um, more options. You know, that was one totally. question that I had, like specific to passive house, um, with with respect to materials. Um, where does passive house uh, not look? at materials to get certification? I mean, I know that you as an architect would intently look at that, but you may be others who are looking for, for that energy performance and comfort and indoor air quality. Um, does it look at materials as part of certification? Where does it lie? Well, it, it, it only does in the sense that it is a partner certification with the Department of Energy um, uh, the energy zero energy star? ready home program, okay. uh, zero energy ready home. So it okay. needs to have the indoor air plus uh, <clears throat> certifications checked off. So yes, it does, uh, but it's not like uh, a living building challenge uh, materials battle, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of a it's it's a good starting point. It isn't the reach, let's say. Okay. Um, yeah, and and you know, passive house of course started out. Um, well, if you really trace the history, it started out in the 70s in, in Urbana and mm -hmm. Canada and, you know, building low energy homes as a, re as a response to the oil crisis of the 70s. 
Then it went to Germany, became an energy standard. And it was really just about energy and, and also about ventilation. So air quality through, through good ventilation. So those two were always together. Um, but then when it came to the U.S. and the U.S. Passive House Institute U.S. broke away from, from Germany, um, they were then able to partner up with the DOE and have the, the partner uh, certification. Um, and, and so that, that kind of made it a little broader as a, as a standard, I would say, because when you do the DOE, Mm -hmm. checklists there's a there's a number of them you know the the thermal bypass of course which works with passive house the uh, indoor air plus and then the water um, the water aspect you know you have to right. uh, minimize your, your hot water runs and, and all that so so yeah it made it a more I guess I think of I think of um, standards you know building standards um, certifications rather like lead and living building are, are just comprehensive they look at everything that they can think of mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Passive House really focuses mostly on energy. So it didn't really design itself as being something to think about site or um, so far not really embodied energy so much um, mm -hmm. or like recycled materials or what have you. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's more focused on the energy, which I do believe is the, is the single most important uh, issue that we have to deal with in, you well, know, as a, as a, culturally or, or, or society wide. Yeah. Well, yeah, with the decarbonization, right? Because that's what we're, that's what we as architects are fighting against. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, um, no, I get it. The energy performance and the, and minimizing that dependency on mechanical systems, right? And how you, how you bring these pieces together in the, God is in the details really for Passive House and how you yeah. put the, put the uh, structure together. So, I mean, just going back to what you were saying about the homes, I, I've been describing it as these green homes, whether, you know, passive house or living building or lead. Um, it's, it's the way they make you feel. You may not even know that it's a certified house. You may not know all the blood, sweat and tears that an architect thought about to put it together, but it's, how it makes you feel right yeah and it's yeah. just it's you can you can tell the difference and um and you yeah and i can't wait to hear your examples on about your projects and show your examples of work um, well i gotta say i'm really intrigued by what you said about creating nooks when you guys changed your house around which i think is really awesome that you do that and it's mm -hmm. so fun um i uh yeah, it, it, because uh, that's another um, another aspect that, that plays into what you're saying. I think what you just said about how it makes you feel is is maybe like the perfect measuring tool for have I done enough with biophilic design? Does this place make me feel alive? And you know, and do I feel healthy and alive? I mean, one of my great inspirations for architecture when I was in high school was Frank Lloyd Wright. And let me tell you, when you walk into to, uh, Falling Water or um, or the Roby House, at least me, uh, it it makes me feel wonderful. Um, and not just because it's a spectacle that it's like, wow, look at all that that wonderful trim. I mean, Roby House it maybe is a little overbearing uh, in a sense. I can't believe I said that, um, but. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the the mastery of the indoor outdoor transitions and the continuity of environment and the the feeling of the building being a an entity like a natural organism and um, and at the same time creating this relationship to the outdoors that's very uh, positive and yeah. uh, you know <clears throat> balanced. So anyway, um, with with. With what you said that with the nooks thing, I could uh, maybe click on to some images here that okay. talk about both passive house. Yeah, oh, here, I'll share my screen here and uh, see if I can pull up some things. All right, so um, I'm going to just show a picture of this house that we just did. Um, 
for the Greenbelt Home Tour, which happens every year in generally July or late, late July or early August. And um, this is a, a source zero passive house that we had on the tour a couple years ago, but it wasn't quite finished mm -hmm. and it didn't have the solar array. And now it does. And so it, the solar array offset all its annual energy. So, um, so anyway, this one um, is a project that we really felt did a lot of the kind of indoor outdoor relationships and mm -hmm. created some of the things that in, in the, in the, the tree hugger article and, and blog posts, we called um, privacy gradients. So when you say nooks, that's kind of what I'm thinking about that. Um, I'm going to pull up the floor plan here. Um, so as an architect, you, I mean, floor plans are what we start with, right? Um, <laughs> so the house has no basement. And so we had to think about creating storage and things that tend to happen in basements, that extra space where you can do something that you wouldn't want to do in the middle of your living room, <laughs> let's say. <laughs> That's a good um, way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so in the upper northwest corner of these plans, we created these kind of flex rooms. So there's some mechanical in there. There's like the water heater on this floor and the um, the ERV ventilator on the on the second floor above it. And um, in fact, I'm just going to click to the second floor. There you can see it. Um, this is an older plan. We actually have this wood floor running throughout the entirety. We didn't. We were going to switch to like a marmoleum or something, but we didn't. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, that that room, that kind of flexible room is, is, is mm. you know, right now this storage room is Legos and um, and sewing and, um, you know, later it might be and it could be a guest room. Um, and so, you know, here we even designed like a shoji screen that could um, close off the flex room from the living space. So um, so that was kind of our sort of. Uh, kind of like the nook idea and it creates a privacy gradient. So the kitchen dining living is one kind of big open space, but then that can be more, you're around the corner, you're out of the way. Um, and then you've got, as you go upstairs, um, everything up here is relatively private. Um, although the storage room you know, with two entries and, and you can leave the door open obviously is a little uh, sort of, in between, there's not as much in between areas because this is quite a small house at 1,800 square feet. Okay. But um, but yeah, so so that was kind of the that was kind of the idea there. Um, I'm going to show another uh, image from our design software. We use Archicad. Um, mm -hmm. It's a a BIM program, and so um, the the wonderful drafting wizards in my office we, we model everything you know so in this in this in this particular lot we were very limited on where we could put the house um, a it was a relatively small lot and b there were, the septic had to be over here and because there was a well over there and there were setbacks so we had to take some walnut trees out and we wound up salvaging and, and repurposing them for this oh, feature nice. wall behind the stair and that's where a lot of the sunlight comes in to the house um, and so it's a it's a kind of a nice like memory of the trees that were there, um, and um, anyway, so so in in this, you can kind of see that uh, all that talk about how it feels and everything has to well has to meld with how this thing works at the most elevated technical level. And to me, that's kind of the the joy of all this is putting putting those things together, you know, and so figuring out how we do a thermal bridge free, uh, you know, airtight enclosure and integrate the ventilation system and, and everything and work with the, the idea of the, you know, the beauty of the house at the same time. That's, that's where it all kind of comes together. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, um, that's, there's, there's a, there's a bunch of, the, I'll show one more thing just okay. because this is such a, a fun image that we made. Oh yeah. Um, where we were kind of just talking about this. Is, so there's that walnut feature wall. Uh -huh. um, but this was kind of the idea, the feeling of the house, you know, that we were that we were after. And um, you know, back when we were in design and we were 
you know, modeling things up in ARCHICAD and creating this sort of continuity of trim uh, that just made a very simple and kind of serene um, enclosure with, without a lot of colors, different colors and materials, but, um, but enough to, to have a sense of order in the space and a level of detail that, um, that related the pieces together through this woodwork program. So it was, um, it was wonderful. I mean, just wonderful working with these clients who, who, who got it and inspired us and wanted also to be, you know, kind of ambassadors about passive house and low energy. So, nice. you know, a yeah. couple of, let's say about uh, maybe two months ago, I had somebody contact me to do a residence and I actually had her on these talks a couple of weeks ago as well to talk about her project. And um, I, I told her, and you could, when, if you see it, she teases me because I, I didn't want to do it. Um, I didn't want to do the, this uh, residential. I just stopped doing residential and, uh, and focus more on commercial architecture. But she's like, you get this type of architecture. This is what I want to do. This is my concept. And she called it, you know, a, an expandable house. And what we ended up I ended up taking the job because she just like, she got it. Right. And she just like pulled me in and I said, okay, I could work with that. You know, and we ended up calling yeah. it. Our concept is living organism. It just, I mean, mm. you called it the organism earlier. So it just makes yeah, sense yeah. on how to, you know, study how a house can, you know, evolve and adapt with different climates and different situations like, like we're dealing with now, right? Um, we're looking at areas where we're instead of like mud rooms, right? We're calling we're calling them clean rooms because and and looking at the concept of or a solution for people to be able to visit us because right now we can't see each other uh, well through a glass, but we can't physically be in the same room uh, depending on you know, the health condition of that person, the safest thing is just to, you know, say hi through outside or the yard. So we're looking yeah, at these yeah. clean rooms, these areas where you can, you can uh, sanitize, use UV lighting and stuff. And then you can go into, you know, the main, the main part of the house, mm. but it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun looking at, at just, um, and looking at passive house uh, elements too. So it, I so I'm doing residential, <laughs> and I can't wait yeah. to to share. You talked into it. I love it. I, yeah, I did, and it was it's you know it it's because she got it, and you know, and working with a client that really understands um, wants oh, know, yeah. that understands how special a house like this can be, not just you know in general, but for people living in it, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Actually, that reminds me. Um, so we just completed a uh, uh, park district source zero passive house project, which we did because the park district wanted to pursue the Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation grant, which paid for um, a lot of the uh, money that it took to get from kind of what a conventional building to a, a net zero building. Um, and uh, it's interesting because when Passive House started, there were these metrics about heating load, cooling load, heating demand, cooling demand, air tightness, and it was just sort of one size fits all. But as Fias has been looking at how, you know, our climates from let's say Key West to Fairbanks, you know, there's a lot of difference there and your approach to energy consumption doesn't make sense for it to be the same uh, in those right. different climates. Plus you really, really need to think about humidity control. How are you going to manage humidity in the South versus in the North? Um, and, and, and if you have a building, like we're working on a, we're consulting on a building, it's a 45 unit apartment building. And so the square footage per person is quite low compared to say a single family house. Mm -hmm. And so the, what, what FIAS, the Passive House Institute US has done, which is really brilliant, is looked at the standard relative to things like density of enclosure and climate. And, it, and there's a little calculator on their website that tells you what your, what your 
target metric should be based on your actual building in your actual climate. So if you go, um, you know, using the, we use a lot of times the Midway airport climate file, because that's closest to us. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we plug in the metrics for our 45 unit building and compare it to the metrics for a single family house. It's very different because of mm -hmm. like, you know, 400 square feet per person or, or 600 versus, you know, a thousand or something like that. So, um, so it, it's a way of, um, of thinking about the building and setting up metrics that give you a clear cut way to go. But then your responsibility as a designer is really tune the building to the local environment, you know, literally the shading that's right around you and, and your, your climate and everything. So, so I love that that helps us think about the building as an organism also through the kind right. of data side. Yeah. Um, and, and I just, but I just wanted to throw that in there. If people are hearing about passive house and thinking it's only about houses, um, it's, it's really, it's really a tool for any scale of building. I mean, pretty much, uh, we, we we're looking at a, a larger, um, multifamily project now. And, um, and yeah, it was a great, tool for the for the Carroll Center here in Oak Park, which just got completed and um, they're in it and they're feeling very happy about having done it, be, starting this before COVID and everything. But you got to realize the ventilation systems over in that building have very high filtration. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you, you, you can you can filter, you know, at, at near HEPA filter levels in mechanical systems and and you can you can scrub out you know larger virus particles. So in in a passive house you have that going and you have that that breathing, uh, you know collecting pollutants, dumping them out the side of the building and bringing fresh air in. Um, and so it's it's a much better way to think about indoor air quality for a building. So whether it's commercial level or single family level, now people are thinking about okay if I'm going to send my kids back to school. How mm. well is my air being scrubbed? You know, did they commission yeah. those systems? Is it just recirculating? The answer is, yeah, probably it is. Um, and and you can't just necessarily plug in a HEPA filter to an existing system because you're going to really restrict the airflow. You have to change the size of the returns. Um, you know, there's there there are some considerations there depending on your system. So um, anyway, I'm I'm kind of go, <laughs> going around this, but you know, but. Uh, no, that's that's good information. I mean, those are the things we think about, right? And I um, is that is that a project on your website? I it is. I yeah, saw it. I'll, yeah, it's it's really I'll share nice. My screen again. I can't um, wait to see it, you know, in person. When you yeah. know, when I was in, there was just an when, article in Wednesday Journal. <clears throat> ah, <laughs> I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna click on it real fast here. Um, oh, there's yeah. another one we oh. did, which is near zero. That's that's not it. That's a different one. Oh, I one. thought that was it. Um, that's what I was. Um... Now that was one from back a few years ago, which is a, another Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation project. But um, this nice. one here, the Carroll Center, is was an old building that we added this uh, addition to. The original building was John Van Bergen, who had worked for Frank Lloyd Wright, and then it had a 1940s edition, mm -hmm. then a 1970s edition, and then they needed a big room. That's the solar farm on the roof, you can see. Um, in addition to the solar farm on the roof, we did a shading, a solar shading thin over the south glazing. Um, yeah, so that's how we get to, to zero. We start with the energy uh, savings of the, of the environment. Mm -hmm. um, this, uh, this big room, we can break into two uh, with this movable wall. And, you know, we had limited colors to work with, but we were trying to work with kind of a landscape for the three colors we had to work with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, getting that biophilic thing going on <laughs> um, as well as we could with our limited colors. So, so, so here it is. Um, yeah, it's uh, that that one is the Illinois Clean Energy recipient for the Zero Energy Building Grant. So now we have to prove it for the first year that it's actually making more energy than it than it uses. Um, and that's so we're in the monitoring phase now. They just opened it a couple of weeks ago. Okay. So yeah, and um, and like uh, like all um, you know, passive house buildings, it's it's uh, it's scrutinized during 
construction and and during the modeling so that you are you know you're confident that you're going to get there and that what you're doing is you're reducing the energy loads passively with the envelope first and then you're making your your, your energy with solar mm. so when i was my first job before freshman year of college u of i i got an internship at the frank lloyd wright home and studio so Ooh. i was that was my first like architecture job as an intern nice. and i don't i was trying to remember how i even got it i think it was my english teacher who said here you want to go he's the one who actually like helped me get through school like get to u of i uh guided me through that process and um i think it was him and so i i was an intern there and it was it was such an incredible experience and a beautiful intro to architecture. Um, I don't, I don't remember what I did there, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the, what I started to do because they needed more people as I started to give the tours myself. Um, nice. and, and that, you know, uh, people from all over the world go there yeah. and take a look and just, you know, visit the home and studio in Oak Park, or even people from Chicago who have never been to Oak Park, you know, it's so, it's, it, there's such a range of people. And so it was, um, it was a really nice intro to, to architecture and getting to know all of that. So, yeah. um, so my question is, Tom, when do we get to see the TBD walking tour of Oak Park? Oh, geez, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, how well, many funny. projects do you have in Oak Park? You have, or, cause you live and work there, right? And then now, and you build there. Yeah, that... yeah, we have, um, uh, geez. I mean, I'm just thinking about the new buildings first. I think we have uh, what the two park district buildings and then uh, one, two, uh, I guess just two new homes, but a bunch of renovations. Okay. And I want to say on renovations, this is really, I've been thinking more and more about this, you know, as an architecture 2030 signatory, you know, the idea is, is to, you know, zero carbon by 2030. And it's becoming more and more evident that we have to be careful not to just tear down buildings and build new ones that are really energy efficient. Because in order to do that, you spend energy tearing down and throwing away the embodied energy of those materials, spending a lot of energy to create new materials to build and then spend the energy building. And so that would give you the spike in energy use, which would be counter counter the, the the idea which is like let's get low energy now so mm -hmm. renovation is definitely where it's at i mean here we are in chicago there are all these buildings and we could do mm -hmm. so much with them and we need to and we need to do it fast um so so yeah i've done a, a lot of renovation projects um we're currently doing a um a net zero retrofit on a Frank Lloyd Wright house, which is wow. an amazing project and daunting because we can't screw up the architecture. Um, fortunately, it's a <laughs> flat roof house, so we can put the solar on the roof without it being seen. Um, but tightening up the envelope, getting storm windows in, replacing the boiler with a geothermal system, because that's the thing, when you go net zero, you, you get rid of gas. You can't be burning fossil fuels anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's all electric we're looking at. So there's a lot of heat pump technology, whether that's geothermal ground source heat pump or air source heat pumps like the mini splits we put in our um, our passive house project so far and um, you know air source heat pumps that are you know the for the for the water heater um, so yeah no electricity condensing dryers instead of gas induction cooktops instead of gas so um, it's it's a different it's a uh, kind of a different kit of parts from the traditional fossil fuel burning home um, but anyway, yes, renovation is, is really, is really big. I think we've, I, I mean, probably done 20 or 30 over the years. I've been in business for about, uh, going on 15 years. Um, but yeah, we're working all over, um, the Midwest really. We have a, okay. a new, um, uh, a new project in Kentucky. We just started. There's a certified passive house being built right now in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, we finished a zero energy 
pass a uh, lead house in Springfield a couple of years ago and um, doing a FIAS source zero passive house uh, for a farm up in Wisconsin. So, um, and you know, around, uh, around the, uh, the Chicago area, Evanston and Western mm -hmm. suburbs and, and not a heck of a lot in the city. We're doing a project right now in the city, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, that's hasn't been as much of our playground. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, well, definitely a variety of, of places. And I'm glad you brought the renovation up or because um, that was a question that I had if somebody's thinking about extending their house, you know, out or mm -hmm. even raising the roof or how is it cost prohibitive or what is a, is it accessible to people like you, what have you heard and what what can you share about that? Yeah, well, it's a really interesting question because every every building, every house is different. And it, when you go at figuring out what's the best thing to do. Now, the, the Frank Lloyd Wright Zero Energy is like a uh, on, on one far end of the spectrum. But then I've been looking at my house and what we can do with, uh, uh, you know, the, sort of the least um, disruption and uh, you know so I guess what I would say is that if you're going to do a gut renovation then you can do a passive house retrofit no problem mm -hmm. but a lot of people aren't going to gut renovate they don't want to move out they don't want to um, do all that they just want to improve the performance um, so generally what I found is that you know if you go to buildingscience.com and you look at what building science corporation has 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 been writing for years and years and years um, stack effect is a big deal in old buildings because you have a leaky roof, uh, air just kind of comes up and out like a chimney, your whole house is a big chimney. So step number one is usually seal up that roof and insulate up there, keep the energy and the air in the building. Um, and then step two is typically, you know, seal around the base. Uh, you look at the pressure plane in the, in the building and it's, you know, it's, it's low up here and it's high down here. And so if you cap the top and you uh, seal up the bottom, you're, you're doing great. And then you start paying attention to the walls. This is from a sort of air tightening and, and insulating point of view. Um, but the thing is, if it's a masonry building, you'll do it one way. If it's a frame building, you'll do it another mm -hmm. way. If yeah. it's a frame building that the siding needs to be replaced, then, hey, let's put a bunch of foam insulation and then put the new siding over it. And we create a thermal bridge free um, simple to install retrofit approach. Um, and we get to choose our siding and really make it work, whether we're doing a historic kind of uh, redo or we want to make it a different modern approach, you know? Um, so it's really, uh, it's really a question of what the design, what the, what the functional needs are of the project moving ahead and, mm -hmm. um, and how you're going to make it a better environment and look at the energy at the same time. So it, it's, uh, it's fascinating and, and complex, I would say. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but the other part of it is like planning for the mechanicals, like how do we go all electric? For me, the first yeah. step was replacing my water heater, the old gas water heater I can get rid of and put a heat pump water heater in, that's, that's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then next, I insulate to lower my energy needs so I can get rid of my furnace and replace it with a mini split heat pump system. Mm. And, and I can get a smaller one because I've insulated, you know? So, um, so that kind of strategizing is what we're really interested in doing for people to kind of help them understand how to go and, and, you know, target a level of consumption that makes sense and then figure out what the steps are to get there. Do you do them all at once or do you do them over the years? And if you do do them over the years, what order should they be done in? So this is why there's no easy like retrofit standard, I think. Right. Yeah. It's a so case I, by case. Yeah. And I think we, it would be great if we could kind of compile case studies in each region um, and, and have more that people could go on and say, well, my building is pretty much like that one. So, Mm -hmm. Now I know my now I know my path. So I think that that's something that I'm interested in doing and partnering up with other people and mm -hmm. um, 
and putting information or case studies out there to, to use and, and figure out, because we got to do this at a huge scale very quickly. If we're going to meet those, just the Paris Accords, you know, not to mention yeah. get to zero energy by 2030, we, we got, we got 10 years. To do. Yeah. How many buildings do we have in the Chicago area that are just, <laughs> just burning fuel? Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll take it one by one. So that's right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tom, for thank you, know, you. Your, for your time and you know insight on Passive House, and uh, you know we, we look forward to just hearing about these projects and you know the the impact that you continue to make. Um, so for next week, we have uh, Luis Montgomery. He's a civil engineer and president of 2IM Group. So we'll be talking rainfall events and uh, preventing soil erosion and all of that fun stuff. <laughs> so, you know, here we are um, talking about designing healthy environments. You know, how, how do we get there? How do we do this? So thank you again so much. Thank and you, Alicia. It was great. Yes. And we'll keep talking and have a, have a right. healthy day. You too. Okay. See you. Bye-bye.